Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Raising Returns Real Estate Podcast. This is a podcast that is designed for real estate investors, whether you're a passive or an active investor. With lots of experience or a little experience, I guarantee you're going to learn something new on this podcast. We have a variety of guests with different experiences come in and give their take on real estate investing. This week, we're going to do something a little bit differently. We're going to do a highlight reel of our previous guests and some of the best things that they had to say. Today, we're going to start out with Asia. Asia had been house flipping. and this part of the conversation, we go into why somebody would invest their money with someone else rather than doing the work themselves. Essentially, Asia is the expert, and that's why somebody else would want to invest their money with Asia because she had knowledge they did not have. Let's take a listen. All the time you'll hear people talking about using other people's money. And when you, you hear that, you're like, well, what about the other person? How do they evaluate you know, deals? How do they get deals? And the other people are the people that maybe they're a busy professional that they don't have the time to invest in real estate, but they understand the value of it. Um, the other people will partner with somebody that is like you, Asia, who understands real estate, understands the investing process. And you've got, you know, you built an entire business around doing all of the work that a hard money lender wouldn't be able to do. I mean, a hard money lender probably nine times out of 10, those guys are not experts in real estate. You are the expert in real estate and they're leaning on your experience to be able to go out and make the right decisions with their money. And that's a good point in general, right? Because a lot of people think real estate is sexy. And I mean, I think we both do, obviously. Sure. We, we think it's one of the greatest investment vehicles ever, right? I mean, think about everybody who's ever amassed any kind of tremendous amount of wealth. You know, I would say 90% of those people have done so through some form of real estate investing. So there's a lot of people who think that it's just a sexy thing to do, but they don't know the first thing about evaluating property, acquiring a property, you know, financing, scheduling, budgeting, any of those things. And, you know, that's where people like you and us kind of come in where, we can assist with those, you know, additional things that someone may just want to invest and earn a percentage on their income. And I think that if someone is going to embark on real estate investing and, and they want to be involved, they need to make sure that they hire the experts, you know, around them in order to make sure it's a successful venture. Okay, that was great. I love that clip. Our next clip is from John Gleason, and John and I are having a discussion on why it's so important to have an attorney review your documents when you're buying, selling, or leasing. Let's listen to John. Before you sign a contract, have a lawyer look at it, or oftentimes, and I know the residential, a lot of residential contracts say, you know, have a five-day attorney clause. So I can sign it because oftentimes, you have realtors and, uh, and brokers saying, we need to get this offer in because somebody else is going to buy it. So you know, that's fine, but you should all, always have a, a, a lawyer then look at it to make sure there aren't any gotchas. And as, as Hayden mentioned once, he said, yeah, it's like buying insurance. And I don't necessarily want to put the legal profession in the same with the insurance profession, but he's right. Um, it may cost a little extra up front and – at the end of the day, we may say, hey, no issues at all, and you kind of scratch your head and go, why did I pay you for that? But there are more than enough examples of someone getting bit because they didn't have somebody look at it. Not all law firms, not all lawyers are created equally, and you want to find somebody that specializes in the type of, of – legal work that you're you're engaging in whether you know a real estate attorney is going to be different than an insurance attorney um yeah. so you, you know one of the one of the things that i have seen people do before is they they'll go on to uh, what legal zoom or, or whatever the different websites are and they'll try to get uh paperwork to fit their very specific needs and their very specific property and that doesn't necessarily work because, you know, one of my favorite quotes is a Donald Rumsfeld quote. And, you know, you've got your known knowns, your known unknowns and your unknown unknowns. And if, you know, 
if you're working with a real estate attorney, one of the best things is they're going to have they're going to have a lot better understanding of what the unknown unknowns are than you do because they've just seen more things. So Yeah, and I and I'll, I'll throw out another and this is actually something I uh, it just finished resolving a situation where a client signed a prop signed a contract was ready to buy it and his financing fell through and he attempted to get his deposit back and they wouldn't give him the, the deposit back because there was no financing contingency in the contract and uh, so I, he called me and I looked at it and my first thing was they're right there is no financing contingency um, he had been given something from a broker though that had a, a timeline and, and a lot of people have these of the various dates in a transaction of when the contract was signed when a deposit is due when the due diligence contingency expires and there was a date on that line and so he reasonably believed, I believe, that he had a financing contingency, uh, even though the contract didn't have one, uh, which anybody that would have looked at it would have realized, hey, there's no financing contingency. We were able, you know, thankfully, to work something out with the seller and, and get it resolved. But you know, that's just that could have been a, a huge issue uh, because he didn't have somebody look at the contract. And, you know, there's all kinds of those stories uh Surveys, another thing, and, and title issues. Oftentimes, you'll buy a piece of property and not have anybody review the title and survey. And uh, you have situations where what you wanted to do with that property, there's deed restrictions or other restrictions that that a uh, a prior owner has put on the property that makes it impossible for you to do what you intended to do. And oftentimes, you can negotiate and get that resolved but doing it after the fact is always more expensive than doing it at the very beginning okay so love that from john and our next clip was from our show with kelly treon with lanasir investments in this clip we talk about building financial models and how it relates to the real estate investment fund so could you kind of walk us through how you might take a deal, analyze it, and what the criteria that people would want to look for to make sure the deal works for them. Sure. So, as you mentioned, we have a model that we use. It's a very advanced, albeit, but it's an Excel spreadsheet. And we take the financials of any prospective property that we're looking at acquiring, and I put those into our model and then I try to stress those numbers. So typically we're looking at properties that have some tenant va base, may maybe some vacancy, but generally we're, we're looking so far at properties that have tenants. And so I'll build in a factor for vacancy. What if vacancy goes up more than what it is now? Uh, what are the rent increases that are in the leases that we have? Do we have fair market value leases in place? And if not, if we lost a tenant and we had to go out and find a tenant at fair market value, would that be a good thing or a bad thing? Would our cash flow go up or go down? So I have assumptions built in for risk factors, basically, and for things that we know are going to happen. Properties need to be maintained. We have to build reserves for when the HVAC units need to be replaced, when the roof needs to be replaced. These things will happen. We don't know when. When we look at a property, we try to guess when, and that helps us value how much we want to pay for a property. But our model tries to take into account all of the risk factors, controllable and the ones that we can't control, and we try to quantify the risk factors to determine if things go in a certain way, and Hayden, you know, we'll run it several different ways, best case scenario, worst case scenario. If things fall a certain way, will we still be able to provide a return to our investors? And that's really the bottom line. Will there be enough cash from the operations of the underlying properties, tenants paying rent, expenses being paid, to return on investment to our, our 
Montessori investors. Okay, so our next clip is from CJ. And this is one of my favorite clips because we talk about reoccurring revenue. And if you know anything about real estate investments, renting a property to someone generates reoccurring revenue. So let's take a listen to what CJ has to talk about. So the biggest thing that I had in my mind as a failure with my IT consulting company is that I did not have recurring revenue. Um, I had to go out and it's what I call, I had to go slay a dragon every day. If I didn't go out and, you know, sell contracts, sell, you know, whatever to, to do development or whatever we were doing, um, if, if I didn't go and do that, we didn't have any money. And it, it ended up being a very rigid pattern of sell, 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 do, 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 sell, 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 do, do, do. And without a stable income flow, it's very hard to, to project your growth and have that stability. Um, and towards towards the end, you know, when I when I started my consulting business uh, in IT, you know, I was in high school, going through college, um, you know, and, and I thought I knew it all. And yeah, you know, that school of hard knocks definitely taught me that I didn't know it all. And as as I was starting to get closer to that crash, I just knew I was working way too hard and way too much for what was left on the plate. And uh, I actually started working with a couple of folks from Action Coach Business Coaching. And they really taught me how to look, look at the business and work on the business and not in the business. And uh, frankly, it was them that ultimately helped me decide, you know, it's going to be, re- uh, I guess, realize how much work it would take to turn my business around. Um, and, uh, and realizing that that's kind of the, the thing that shoved me over the edge after working with them for a couple of years and seeing everything uh, that said, you know, I, I just need to reset. Um, and having that business knowledge... You know, really, really has helped me with the real estate endeavor. You know, the the thought of recurring revenue and how to <laughs> to safely and conservatively grow your portfolio and realize what those risks are. Um, you know, I, I definitely took a lot away from those coaching sessions, and highly recommend everybody that gets into this has a mentor or has a coach because it will help you grow tremendously. Um, and I, I mean, like that's that's exactly the reason for this podcast is to be able to educate those who are trying to get into real estate or just haven't even seen the different perspectives of different types of investing. But I, I want to touch back on what you said. You know, I always hear people say, "Oh my gosh, there's a subscription for everything now," and I laugh because I think to myself, "Well, yeah, reoccurring." reoccurring revenue has been around forever. Everybody pays their mortgage or has paid rent. That's a subscription. So, it, and the beauty of real estate is that reoccurring revenue. All right. So our next clip is from Sean Parker and Sean dives into what he believes will be the economic outcome due to the current situation from COVID-19. There's a lot of positive thoughts here and I'd like to share them with you. Let's listen to them. Okay. Makes sense. Um, yeah, this, let's define this situation a little differently. And I'm going to use the word situation different than an economic event um, because it, this came about because of a medical situation that uh, penetrated our economy. We have an economy that is globalized, and it is globalized in a very bad way. When you look at geopolitical theorists out there, um, these are highly educated people, and they talk about, the interdependence that we've created uh, over the eight years of Obama, over the eight years of Bush, and over the eight years of Clinton. So we have 24 years in our history of offshoring our production, 24 years of, of making everything incredibly cheaply in, the, in, the, in uh, Asia. And I was going to say the Orient, but they, they really don't use that term anymore. Um, so, so what's happened is, the United States has become a service sector economy, and we don't produce a whole lot of things here. Service sectors are are, are not able to create true value in a, in, in a sense, with the exception of what we do when we actually when we actually um, craft and, and create. So, so we effectively eroded away our base overseas. And what we didn't know through the course of this situation, as I'm calling it, is that we had eroded away some of our key infrastructure. And you're going to see a big return of key infrastructure. So that's one of the, that's, that's a thought that I want to hold up in the air for people to, to think about, is 
as manufacturing returns to the United States, and it will, what does that mean? So, so our first golden opportunity is manufacturing. Um, the government has to do it. There's no question about it. Uh, we are going to be creating a lot of warehouse space. A lot of a lot of warehouse space that we have existing is going to be converted to manufacturing facilities, so we can start making ibuprofen here again. We can start making acetaminophen. We can make gloves, masks, and gowns here in the United States. But also, we have to make a lot of other things that are strategic to our ability to resist global problems like this. Um, but here's what probably won't happen. We probably won't see the jobs return in the portion that we expect because robotics and automated manufacturing processes are going to be much more inherent in the way that this comes about. So it's going to be much more efficient and cheaper for this manufacturing to return. Um, so so we, we have the upside but, but we pro- on, on, the, on the real estate play, but we won't see as much of an upside as, we, as many people will think on the human side of this thing. But the good news is we have an infrastructure that will come into play, and the United States will rebuild the infrastructure. So where the jobs are going to occur is in the service sectors, electricians, concrete workers, iron workers, plumbers, pipe fitters. Um, I think we'll see a resurgence in the unions to a degree because these people are very well governed inside of a union relationship. But we're going to see the, the unions become more modernized in the way that they that they step forward. And uh, hopefully that is a win-win for everybody the way that occurs. All right. What a great clip from Sean. It was very positive, and I believe a lot of those things that he talks about are going to be coming true soon. Now, our next clip is with Chris Watson, and Chris is a financial advisor. And in this portion of our conversation, he talks about how important it is to have a solid foundation when you start investing. Let's listen to Chris. So, so the big question I always get from people is where should I put my money? Right. Well, take a step back and, and first kind of define based on your income, how much of your income are you saving? So what are you actually paying yourself with first? And then what are you paying everybody else with based on your income? And regardless of age, the goal is to save about 20 to 25 percent of whatever you make. Um, so if you make a hundred grand, twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars is what you you should look to pay yourself with first, uh, and then obviously taxes and lifestyle is going to come out of the remaining balance. So once we've decided, hey, we can save that twenty or twenty-five percent, now we just need to decide where do we put it. And you know we go through the list of what are your options. Number one for most people is their their company retirement plan, whether that's a pension, whether that's a four hundred one k or a TSP, something to the, that that effect, that's probably going to get a piece of it because your your employer nine times out of ten is going to match. So we say, okay, you get a five percent match. Let's put five percent into that plan. Now we have to sit back and go, well, where do we go with the other fifteen percent? After that, um, I'm a big uh, fan of saying, look, why don't you build up your emergency fund? So for times like this, or for times when your car breaks down, or you know something happens with your home, whatever your situation is. Um, you've got some money to kind of weather the storm. And once you get that built up to, say, three to six months of, of lifestyle or living expenses, we can redirect any sort of a surplus to other asset classes. So that's kind of where real estate could come in. That's a, a, a good asset class by definition because it keeps up with inflation, and it's not directly correlated with the stock market. You could kind of argue back and forth, yes, it is, but uh, and it does kind of mimic – I guess what the market does if, if the market declines for a long period of time, home prices or property values will decline. But there are some some plays out there where you can still see, you know, rents are being paid, companies are still paying their rent, uh, tenants are still paying their rent. So depending on how how much leverage you have into that property, it should still be uh, hopefully a cash flowing vehicle for you even in times like this. And if we say, okay, real estate, you know, does make sense, well, where do I go? Well, you can go buy properties in the residential market and rent them out to tenants, be the landlord yourself. You can go buy commercial properties, rent them out to businesses, um, again, being the tenant. Or you can kind of invest in a fund that does that property management for you. Uh, They find the the properties, they lease them up, uh, they pay the bills, they take care of all the maintenance. uh, And then depending on how the fund works, you're going to get a piece or a return of whatever that cash flow looks like. So, again, it's kind of just saying, look, 
uh, and my, my biggest thing to people is make sure you build a foundation first. So I would, I would very much say, look, why don't you, you get your reserves built up? Why don't you get a solid foundation of kind of steady eddy things in place and then look to do, you know, some things that maybe have a little more responsibility tied to them uh, as opposed to just going in, you know, guns blazing to maybe things you're not really ready for. And then if a time like this happens, either you're over leveraged and don't have, a, have the ability to, to pay the bank and or pay whoever you're in debt to. And uh, at that point, you're kind of at a position of, well, we just got to ride this out and hopefully it works. Um, but my biggest thing is try to get a good foundation set up so you, you don't uh, expose yourself in, in tough times. Okay. Now, our next clip is from Tristan. And Tristan is the writer for Columbus Business First, and he covers all of the commercial real estate. One of the things that Tristan has the pleasure of doing is interviewing lots and lots of investors. So let's listen to what Tristan says they all have in common. Well, you know, a lot of them really, they're just, they're just numbers people. Um, I think, uh, I think people uh, have an open mind to, um, you know, approaching the city, taking a look around at some of its properties. Um, there's a great number of uh, value add properties that that we're seeing change hands. I think maybe there wasn't quite the appetite for that that there used to be, where somebody is kind of buying um, buying a kind of a, a, a distressed or an older property and, and investing and turning it around. We obviously have a lot of great names here who um, like to do that already, um, but but some of the out of state players are coming in and saying, hey, you know, you guys have um, it's it it is worth our investment to come in and buy a property and spruce it up. All right. Thank you, everybody, for listening. I hope you enjoyed listening to these clips. These are our top clips from our show so far. And I really love doing this because we were able to show you the best points that each one of our guests have made so far. Now, we do a podcast every single week, and we want to make sure that you can subscribe. You can check us out on our website, lanaceraainvestments.com slash education. You'll find all of our content there. We've got our YouTube videos we post every Friday. We've got articles we write, and we have tons of educational content if you are a passive or active investor. Really appreciate you listening. Until next time.